I've brought on Chris Else to the podcast, who has interacted with my content uh, in the past. And recently, well, I, I suppose Chris will talk about this, but you've landed your first cybersecurity job. And um, we're having you on to talk about your processing going through that and, and what you've learned from everything. But thanks for joining, mate. Really great to have you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's pretty cool to meet during video because I know prior it was emails and like, yeah. you know, LinkedIn messages. LinkedIn and messages. That. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, it's really cool. And I, like, I think we, because we've kind of been chatting probably like sporadically for six months, I would say. So how long have you been in your current role, I guess now? Yeah, um, going on about four months, maybe about four and a half, if I had to look mm -hmm. back. And I actually think we've been in correspondence for maybe over a year. Okay. Um, I think it's been about that long. Well, I do know you did start commenting on some of the content early on. So that there was definitely that interaction. And then it kind of was like back and forth chat after that. So that it's been cool to kind of see your journey from the sidelines as well. And then really great to have you on now. So maybe you could give the listeners a bit of background to what your current day to day role is. Yeah, sure. So I work for a cybersecurity company as a cybersecurity um, engineer intern. So I'm in an internship, which recently got extended, and uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, I technically work for a VAR, which is V-A-R, it's short for Value Added Reseller. So that company, what they specialize in, they um, have different cybersecurity software and tools that they help provide to different clients and companies. And on top of that, there are the services that can come with that as well. So sometimes you'll have a customer that's one, or both or one or the other. So it's a pretty wide bit of exposure to what's happening in the industry in terms of use cases, technologies, and actual like engineering processes behind that. So um, pretty exciting mm -hmm. to see all that training and just being exposed to that. Yeah, so that's that's super interesting because I've never spoken to anyone who has done this before, even just like from a personal professional level, uh, not just on the podcast. What does that involve? Does that involve things ranging from tuning security systems for the specific environment? Or is it more, hey, we've got one or a couple of these products and we want to integrate into the current security stack? Yeah, uh, this is where it probably gets more into the consulting world, really. So think even it from that uh, sort of frame. Um, so oftentimes it depends on the needs and use cases of whatever customer is at hand. So yeah, it can involve sometimes getting hands on the service side. But oftentimes it's working with teams already established in those companies. So right. it can vary though. There's, there's a little bit of variation there, um, but it's basically that. So I think the first step is um, really listening to the needs and what tech stacks are being used, You know, different successes, different things that those companies are going through. And oftentimes the listening step is probably the most critical because mm. sometimes companies, they have so much going on that during that first meeting, it might take more than one, where it's just yeah. like, hey, you know, like, tell us what's going on in terms of what you might need. And all of a sudden, you know, they may be like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about this last week, or oh, yeah, come to think of it now. This is another area that we're looking to uh, tighten up security on or different things like that. So um, mm. that listening step is really critical. And uh, I think after that, it's a little more fluid with the implementations or, you know, sometimes just guiding to the implementations and things mm. like that. And this could be quite interesting just from a from your perspective of what you're seeing now is more often than not you're seeing the clients and customers that you're working with is they are lacking a specialty in a certain area and that's why they're reaching out to your type of company or they're just under resourced in general so they might have the specialty but they just don't have the i guess the the person power to get projects over the line do you, do you see kind of a 50-50 split between those or is it more one versus the other? I think it's probably case by case, but in general terms, it can be one or the other, sometimes both. And, and oftentimes what I see in companies, it's not so much a lack of things. Usually it's just a capacity thing where, mm -hmm. you know, you already have teams are like, hey, we're already quite full with yeah. what we have currently going on. We just might need the extra help or support. Or it might be like, hey, we're looking to change up our tools you know, and we want to like have a smooth transition into that. Yeah. So I'd say that's probably more likely than not a typical, you know, use yeah. case environment. I, I would definitely say that's been my experience in seeing just they're great teams, but often multi-hatted for quite a lot of roles within their own organization. And they're 
yeah, transition wires or maybe they need something just fine tuned or fixed or, or whatever it is. So let's jump back to you. So this is your first cybersecurity job. What were you doing prior to this? <laughs> so this might give people a little bit of inspiration uh, and I poke a little bit of fun at myself, but I, I think that there's some uh, potential insight here. Um, I used to be a chef. And before that, I worked a bunch of other different jobs. Uh, yeah. I was a barista, I was a bartender. So I worked a lot of service industry jobs, but I was also um, a chief strategy officer for a seafood company. So I actually got to learn a lot about import export and like the logistics right. of getting fresh fish from here to like Hawaii or New York and then setting up that supply chain from scratch with no knowledge and working closely <laughs> with uh, the company CEO on that, which is really fun. So. Mm. Um, if you need to know how to get a fish from anywhere in the world to point A to point B, I could probably tell you how to do it and the challenges that you might face. <laughs> That's super interesting. And it, like, I, I definitely, if people have been listening to previous episodes, like people often come in to these cybersecurity roles from a very diverse background. I, I think one of the early ones was a pen tester who did used to be a barista as well. Someone, someone also had a really weird job. I can't think. Oh, it was, um, I, I haven't interviewed them, but it was an ex-colleague of mine. He used to be a restaurant manager and just one day decided he wanted to be a cloud engineer and is real is phenomenal at it, but it was just interesting. He was just like, oh, I don't want to be in the hospitality industry anymore. I want to, yeah, work cybersecurity. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really interesting. I want to touch on maybe, because this is new to me as well, kind of your background. So I'm, I'm learning as the listeners are learning. Your role in doing the logistics for, I guess, moving fish around the world, did you see skills that you learned there, whether they were soft skills or hard skills, and could see how they could translate into another cybersecurity role? Oh, yeah, 100%. So, uh, you know, like on a lot of job postings or like different roles, so say works well under ambiguity. <laughs> or needs to, or, or basically needs to figure things out and be resourceful, you know? Yeah. Um, definitely Google was my best friend and actually like calling places to see like, hey, how does this work? And then like mm. taking note of that information. Um, so that's a big one. Um, the other one is managing like project management. And I know mm. that sounds like a very like big topic, but really day to day, it's just managing time, managing resources and just keeping people in the loop. I think that's mm. the big part of it. I think it's a fairly simple thing to do as long as you're not too stressed about, you know, getting those things done. And, and the environment, I think, has to be copacetic to that. Um, but ultimately, it was really that. And so Google was my best friend. Uh, luckily, I had a, a boss and the CEO I worked with who was very supportive. So that was good having that sense of agency to do that. I think that's yeah. another very important thing. So the culture um, facilitated that. And I think part of it was is getting that trust because I uh, also worked as during that time simultaneously in the same company. I was also a Japanese seafood fishmonger apprentice. So I was literally breaking down the fish, grabbing my bare hands, putting them in the containers and being trained by the CEO <clears throat> to do that. And then saying, hey, we got to send this somehow to Hawaii. How do we do that? And it's not like you just take the fish and put it in a plastic bag with ice and be like, OK, bye. You you actually have to get like food, <laughs> food, food grade packaging. And we had to use temperature loggers to stress test the packaging under a bunch of what if scenarios. Right. So there's all kinds of food regulation laws and stuff you have to follow. So here's how it relates to what the question you asked. Those transferable soft skills of communication, working with stakeholders, explaining complex topics in simple terms to get buy in from someone that trusts that process and that individual mm. that's Part one. Part two is the more technical side of it. So GRC for cybersecurity. Well, if you're familiar with the food industry and just working through compliance and rules with health departments, mm. there you go. Import export laws, big yeah. one. All right. So that translates well. And then also like the stress testing and taking the empirical data, like temperature logging. Mm. It's very similar looking at a log inside a SIM tool or something yeah. like that. Like you need to make sure that the data is accurate, the measurements accurate and you know, false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives, mm -hmm. very real thing. And so even though the medium might be different in those two industries, the basic concepts are very similar. So I'd say that anyone who's worked in a service industry job, like your, your the buddy you were mentioning earlier who worked as a barista, a lot of good soft skills are when you have to work with people every day, especially those who need ca caffeine, because people who need caffeine, 
they're a whole different, you know, kind of kind of person to work with. I, I used to be a barista for a little bit, and there's there's nothing more intense sometimes than someone who comes in at 5 a.m. and says, hey, I need some coffee right now. And you totally understand it because you've been that person, too. So you're like, yeah. OK, here you go. Here's the coffee, you know, and yeah, doing that yeah. in a timely manner. So, yeah. Yeah. I love your comment there because I think it's quite common across people who have been in the industry a long time. But Google being your best friend, like it's such yeah. a, a great reason, whether it's Google or even like I've got colleagues now that rely on um, like chat GPT or other AI chat to just get like, go out and grab as much data as possible and give you a summary. And then it's up to you to decide whether that information is useful or not. So it's not just relying on it. Uh, but I gave a talk recently at a university and uh, my initial quote to the people that were watching was there's no dumb questions unless you can Google it. And then that's a dumb question. So, and that's, I think true for a lot of people when you go into a job and you have a manager, don't go and ask just a raw question. You need some of that research behind you first. And that research could just be Googling that question and seeing if someone else has answered it. And then you can go to them and be like, here's the problem. Here's the research I've done. I just need some more guidance from here. And I think that's a better step than, hey, I don't know what to do. Because they will probably just turn around and go, have you Googled it? Yep, 100%. And, and I yeah. think uh, to add on to that, another really interesting thing is, and, and you might have seen me doing this on LinkedIn over time, is developing a professional network of people that you might physically see in the field day to day, mm -hmm. but also on LinkedIn, LinkedIn like a digital one. So yeah. oftentimes when I was doing home labs or things, if I got really stuck, and this is after the Google search, after the research, and I was just hitting my head against the proverbial brick wall, yeah. I would be like, okay, maybe I should tap into someone in my network and ask and say, hey, here's what I'm working on. I researched this. I'm still hitting a wall. Do you have any feedback on this? Or just just briefly, you know, and, and mm. obviously kind of keep it kind of short. And nine times out of 10, people are really cool about it. They're like, hey, yeah, like yeah. here's a resource. Go check this out. And what's cool about that it helps build that sense of community. And yeah. I think I think that's where a lot of people sometimes, especially like college grads, I think sometimes that is a point of logic or a way to develop one's own portfolio that sometimes mm -hmm. gets forgotten or maybe it's not uh, addressed a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that when people spend the time just a little bit to invest in uh, connecting with people, like you and I connected online and then look where we're at now, you know, it, it took time to do that. And, and I think being genuine and sincere too is, of course, yeah. um, the number one thing. Like, you know, you, it should never be looked at as like a transactional thing. Like, whenever I connect with someone, I don't see it as like, oh, I'm connecting with this person because I want something. It, it's like I want to connect with this person because I value what they do, and I really respect what they do. And if that connection evolves over time, then there can be a sharing of knowledge or experiences when time allows. And I, yeah. I think keeping it that simple is really important. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes that can be a job reference stuff like that, but that's kind of proven over time and under certain circumstances, you know, mm, so. Mm, yeah. Very true. So I guess we'll jump into what your transition was like from, I'm assuming your your last role was the fishmonger setting up strategy to get fish from Hawaii to LA. Was that your most previous role before you kind of jumped into this one? Close. Um, this might be a bit of a twist. I actually was a business development manager for a SaaS company that ah, special okay. that's yeah, that specialized in uh, education software. So I actually had a management role uh, working within tech prior. And that's probably because I had just gotten my bachelor's degree at the time. And that bachelor's degree happened to have domain knowledge that really mapped to that particular company. So that's right. probably what helped get me hired at that time. Yeah. yeah. And so then what was your transition like between that and this kind of role? A very long, pa I'll say it was a very long patient hike, not a marathon. I don't yeah. like the I don't like the marathon analogy because sometimes you have to stop and smell the roses along your journey and you got to yeah, breathe and rest. Um, but some people dig the marathon analogy. I, I think I'm just splitting hairs at this point. But um, I think what it was is I had, um, you know, moved from that job and I was basically saying to myself, hey, I like tech, but I want to be more technical. I like the managerial aspect, but I want to learn some hard skills. So where do I learn that and, and what do I want to learn? Um, I started noticing that like critical infrastructure was getting hacked and all these other hacks in the news. And it kind of made me upset to read it. Cause I'm like, why are people in hospitals who are innocent being hurt by bad actors, you know, mm. for example. 
And so I, I kind of channeled that frustration, anger into saying, I should be proactive about this and learn some stuff. And that's how I got into cybersecurity. So at that point, I started uh, working on home labs, compiling a bunch of information of just what's out there. So just like trying to Google hunt, learn some lingo of like what's the difference between a red team and a blue team and what that means. And just to kind of give an idea of the state of play in the industry as much as I could within a shorter time window. And then I realized, oh, you know what? And this isn't required for anyone, but for me personally, I, I enjoy going to school and I'm in a privileged position where I think I have the means to, to do so in the sense of taking out a student loan isn't going to break my bank. So I acknowledge that. I know for many people that's still very challenging. I very much sympathize with that. Um, but for me, school became an option. And so I pursued a master's degree in cybersecurity. Okay. And it was through that master's degree while uh, learning all that stuff a few months later and doing home labs concurrently during that time independent of school, um, I happened to connect with someone at the company I'm currently at. And this was a little bit early on. And so they started, much like you, seeing that progression I was making a little bit incrementally at a time. Mm. And eventually, uh, I was you know, at a point where I was having a conversation with that individual on LinkedIn. They were like, hey, our company has like a summer internship. It's challenging, but you should apply. I was like, OK. So I applied and I got in, um, which is cool. Um, but I think before that critical moment of getting the job, it was the uh, path that led to that, which was doing home labs, having some frustration of not having things work. You know, a, a lot of people see the final result, but a lot of times that the path of pain to get there, <laughs> or, or or maybe not the path of path of pain, but sometimes the path of failure, which is where learning can happen. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't get talked about enough. And so yeah. for me, I, I, I like to be transparent about that and say, oh, no, I'm not a cybersecurity genius. I just happen to try to work hard, try to work smarter, try to learn from people who are smarter and much more talented than I am and still do. So like connecting with people and, and being humble about it and saying, hey, I, I want to get good at this. But like, how should I do that? Or like, mm -hmm. how should I like learn to search and do that Google hunting too to be accountable to do that? Mm -hmm. So it was just a lot of uh, initial fun, excitement, some frustrations. I got a couple comp TIA sits along the way, which I think mm -hmm. was a little bit helpful just to demonstrate an interest in some knowledge of, mm -hmm. um, you know, being able to sit down, take an exam and say, yeah, I'm dedicated to trying to retain this knowledge just to get a, a feel for what the industry is like. I think that's important. Um, and that was it. So yeah, I, I wish I could say, yeah, I went to school and got the job the next day, but it's like, no, no, no. I, I blogged about my stuff. I spent months networking. I, uh, um, definitely have a lot to still learn and still pursue yeah. that. So I, th I think that proactive mindset can help a lot of people. And to be fair, in this economy right now, that's very hard to have sometimes because the job market is very challenging for a lot of people. So I think that whenever yes. I tell whenever I tell people my path, I'm kind of like, hey, just make sure you go at a pace that's comfortable for you, your responsibilities, what you need to do. Don't Don't beat yourself up too much if you're not quite where you want to be yet with enough consistency and, and just maintain some level of accountability that will happen in time. And uh, yeah. especially with the, the cool people you meet along the way, which, you know, every good story has a supporting cast of characters. And I think it's really important for people to over time cultivate that too, because at some point in life, they'll be the supporting character for someone else. And so I always yeah. try to make a point to pay it forward to others on their journey as well, like others have done for me. Yeah, that that's really interesting. And consistency, I can see is the key there like consistency in networking consistency in in effort and i really liked your analogy of how you don't like the marathon that it's a hike because you could extend that further in that there are hikes out there that are overnight hikes or like i think about hikes that you can do where there's a checkpoint and then you leave and you come back and you do that you continue on that hike and eventually you do the whole hike but that's i think a really good analogy for people in that the knowledge that you accumulate even if you walk away from it and you might lose some knowledge when you come back it is very easy to get back to that level and then continue on so it should be a go at your own pace to achieve whatever goal you want to achieve so with your master's degree how did you find the skills that you learned there from that because i know we're probably in a time at the moment where cybersecurity education from traditional university tertiary education is quite varied in because they're just general even master's degrees are, are often quite general 
And I feel when I talk to people, and I'm going to have someone on soon to talk about their PhD research into different cybersecurity degrees, which would be really interesting. But I find they quite often lack hard skills and they're just teaching the normal soft skills that you would probably get arguably from any other degree you would do. And, and my personal opinion is that you could probably do a degree that is more beneficial in the short term and get those soft skills than doing a cybersecurity degree if you were after a master's. Because I know our industry doesn't require degrees, which is a big thing. Like a doctor needs a degree, an engineer needs a degree, but anyone in cybersecurity doesn't really need a degree. So I'm interested to get your thoughts on your master's program and what that was like. Yeah, so I went to school at Western Governors University. That's um, a school that's fully accredited. And uh, what it is, is it allows you and students to take courses online in a self-paced manner. So it's not like you're beholden to be here at Tuesday at five o'clock for two hours and yeah. do this. So I, I kind of like that because at the time I was, you know, uh, looking for a job. I hit one that flexibility, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. So that was really helpful. And it also gave me enough time to like explore and do home labs and stuff. But when I was in the program, um, I actually think their program is really good, uh, especially, and I can only speak on the master's level side of it. They have a bachelor's program, but I can only speak on the master's component. Um, my bachelor's degree is in economics that classified as a STEM degree. So that allowed me to basically have the STEM background to get into uh, uh, okay. master's in cyber. Um, I will say in the defense of economics, you do enough statistics and calculus where you do enough math where I'd say there's enough empirical rigor for that to be like, okay, we, we can... We can let someone kind of transition from that to computer science, uh, basically, or, or cybersecurity. Um, I thought that their program, and I still do, think it's very good because they cover a pretty wide area. And to your point earlier, it's not like you're going super in-depth into a particular technical domain because the world of cyber is so wide. So I would say, for one, no one, and this might sound a little contrarian, I don't think anyone needs a cybersecurity degree to have a successful career in cybersecurity at all. I think I think I think people if you got the grit, you got the passion, you do home labs and you can demonstrate you can do the thing. Um, I think that's really just the main objective um, for me. I just know with my personality, I liked having that initial guidance to kind of have a pre structured setup. And to me, that price point economically made sense from a cost benefit analysis just for where I was in life at that time. So I was willing to, to undergo that. But I have met people that never got a college degree they're just wizards with cybersecurity, and it's amazing to see what they do and i have the utmost respect for that too um what i can say is that the masters that i had what i really liked is it included two comptia certifications and you get a voucher for the cas plus and the cism that don't expire until a year later so what's nice is even after the degree you know, and it's part of your tuition, but you know, it comes included and bundled in. So it's like, cool, I'm not just getting a degree, but I do get some industry certs to at least mm. illust illustrate that, hey, I was able to at least appreciate the topic enough to sit down, take the exam and, and illustrate that much. But when it comes to the day to day of being in the job market and doing doing the cybersecurity work, I would agree that there still is a slightly different approach to that. That's more, um, I don't want to say real world, but more just hands on the keyboard, get to it than necessarily what you might experience in your day to day in school. And, and I think that's fair because between academia and real world, like I was a chef, I never went to culinary school. I learned just by working at kitchens, Yeah. It, but I worked with people who went to culinary school. But ultimately, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, we still had to make food, make a product. And in the case of cybersecurity, we still have to secure a system and yeah. make sure things are there so yeah so that that's kind of my my long explanation of uh you know kind of yeah. kind of explain the masters versus what i see you know and the job market yeah i actually really like that for probably because so, you're based in the us so mm -hmm. this is this kind of thought is coming from the fact that that degree is us centric and has the comp stuff and then the vouchers is that i know unless it's changed quite a lot of government jobs do require those as entry level certs or entry level um, you need to start attempting them in your first 12 months while you're at that government job. So I actually quite like that, that they've kind of looked and said, well, where are the gaps in the market? Majority of people could go and work for government and here's a first stepping stone for you to do that. 
Um, yeah. I just know it's different for, like in Australia, it's completely different for government roles. Don't require that kind of stuff, but um, that's good that, that that master's degree had that bundled in as well to kind of give you a nice stepping stone, I guess. Yeah, and, and I should clarify one thing too, that's another part of kind of like my education goal is that for me, I already knew before going to that master's, I, I had come to a point in life to um, make this kind of agreement with myself and kind of this strategy or this long-term commitment that I would actually like to get a PhD someday. Cause I, I actually like research. That's the reason why not because I think anyone needs a PhD for cyber, <laughs> but um, ultimately I actually want to get my PhD in mechanical engineering. And then if time allows after that, if I have enough energy to go back to school after that, um, maybe go back and get a PhD in cyber just to combine the two, two because I like critical infrastructure a lot uh, yeah. in industrial control systems. So, um, you know, for, for me being able to come to that point where it's like, oh yeah, I kind of did a deep dive with research into this. To, to me, that's very intellectually stimulating, but but I wouldn't say that's a hard requirement to get a job or have a career. <laughs> Not yeah. at all. That, that That's just that's just something me, myself and I are like, oh yeah, let's go do this. <laughs> so that that's just like, it seems super weird. So you did an economics bachelor, you're going to do a, ma you did a master's of cybersecurity and then you want to do a PhD in mechanical engineering. Yeah. What, is there a particular thing that you want to research for your PhD in mechanical engineering? Currently right now, and this might change in the future, so don't hold me to it. I feel like I'm going to need another year or two to digest this. Um, yeah. I'd like, I'd like to research how artificial intelligence can be applied for, um, protecting, defending against critical infrastructure. So like, say like power plants in particular. Right. So in, in researching what happens when you merge or have a convergence of IT and operational technology so intense to where these things are running very closely in parallel. And then how do you really harden a system so well that you don't have that system leak any data? And like, how could you do that from a mathematical perspective with enough rigor where it's not that it's foolproof, but it's like really robust. So to me, mm -hmm. in general, that sounds like an interesting topic to handle. Um, and I'm sure there's some hardware components in that that I probably want to really focus on to kind of mm -hmm. narrow it down. But that's the general gist um, okay. right now. So because what I find fascinating when you have power plants or you have hospitals or you have critical infrastructure, um, a lot of times it's this intersection of cybersecurity principles, but also with mechanical, chemical or electrical engineering, too. So oftentimes there are two separate teams of people with unique domain knowledge who work together to make sure the design and security of those systems um, are very robust. And so me, <laughs> maybe this is a bit over ambitious. I'm like, what would it be like if someone knew both <laughs> and like, and like, and like still yeah. worked with that, but still worked within those teams. Um, yeah. You know? So for me, that's kind of the intellectually stimulating part and the challenge where it's like, Oh yeah, if I could pull this off, that'd be a really cool way to kind of have a deeper intuition of what uh, occurs in that space. Yeah, oh, we could do so. One of one of my previous roles, I worked at Dragos, which was a technology company for uh, OT security, essentially. And that is a question that gets asked a lot. And it it's funny that when you mentioned the convergence of IT OT, which is happening, it's not happening because it makes it better to do the job of so. Let's say oil and gas. Merging IT does not make pulling oil out of the ground and transmitting it any easier. What it does let you do is see market variations and react quicker to those market variations. So it's it's a pure, purely business driven uh, profit um, center kind of task, which is why that convergence is happening, which which does cause risk. So yeah, huge question of, of how to secure it, especially when it relates back to, like you said, with people in hospitals. Hospitals are different because it's like the doctors need IT to do their job better for scans and stuff, and, and that's linked in there. But if oil and gas goes down, cars don't get fuel, food doesn't get delivered to supermarkets, like there's cascading effects there that, that does impact society. So yeah, that could be a whole topic on its own. So if you do decide to start a PhD down the road, we'd love to have you back on and, and talk about that because, yeah, super interesting topic. So cool. I want to jump back to uh, kind of like 
all the jobs that you've done in, in your career and pathway through to where you are now, what's been a highlight for you? And it, it doesn't have to be in the current role that you're in or, or getting in, but just somewhere in that path, what has been, what really stands out for you? There's, uh, I, I say this as hopefully inspiration for a lot of people that may not be in the four year traditional school path or something like that, or maybe had moments in life where they just took a bunch of different routes through life. And they're like, wow, I never necessarily came to a point where like my career was like solidified out the gate right after high school, you know? Mm. So, so I say, I say this from that perspective, I was, when I was getting my bachelor's, I actually took a break, <laughs> a break, we'll, we'll say to absence for, uh, well over a decade before I came back to school and got my master's and I only had two classes left to get it. That was it. And so I took those classes online eventually, uh, when COVID happened, got my degree and that felt very, um, satisfying. And also I have a minor in music because I was a music student. So I got, I technically got both of them at the same time, but, um, so that was a very big feeling of accomplishment and achievement there because, you know, sometimes I think there's a risk. And I think sometimes people put, uh, and I'm guilty of this, I had put too much pressure on myself of feeling that my sense of worth wasn't necessarily um, valued or where it was at because I had quote unquote failed to achieve the task of getting my bachelor's degree. And so when you see tons of job postings, not all jobs, but many jobs um, in different industries say, hey, that's like sometimes a minimum requirement, not always, but it's, it's very frequent even to this day. Mm -hmm. And so every time I saw that, it was just kind of a little disheartening every single time. And when you see thousands of those on the job hunt, it's like, oh, man. And even though I was a chef, you know, you don't need a degree to be a chef. So I was like, cool. But I got burned out in the culinary industry just from yeah. doing it so long. So for me, it was like, hey, now that I want to do technology and I want to get back into that sector, I, I need to find some way to skill up. And for me, that was just finishing the bachelor's degree with those two classes, you know, getting past the finish line. Um, and then also after that, I was like, Hey, that was cool. Well, let's just do a master's and see what that's like, you know? So I, I think for anyone, um, and for myself, that was, that was a big goal. That was a big sense of empowerment that helped me just in general, um, re reappreciate the value of education, whether it's through an academic institution or just Googling things and having fun or hanging out with a community of people. Um, that's the big one for sure, hundred percent. I'm interested. You, so taking a ten year break, that's amazing to come back and do the two subjects to finish off that degree. Did you think that taking that ten year break was it because you couldn't see yourself in a career doing using the economics degree, and so there wasn't any real drive career wise to just finish off the last two? And it wasn't until you were like, I want to get into another industry and I want to do a master's. So I'll finish this and then I'll finish the master's because that my goal is to work here. Yeah, I think that was part of it. And I think for me, I was just at a point in life where I, I just didn't feel like being an economist was necessarily where I thought my career aspirations would go. And so I just kind of had this period of, I won't call it wandering, but a period of searching that just happened to take a lot longer than I thought. And during that tenure stretch or a little bit more than that. That's when I became a chef and stuff too. So I'd worked in the culinary industry during that time and had a sense of purpose there for that. So it's just kind of like my life just took a transition in that direction. And then when that chapter closed, then it was like, oh yeah, I should probably do the tech thing, you know, and like start skilling up. But then it's like, oh yeah, I need to get that for your degree first because I only have two classes away. I didn't want to yeah. go to waste. And, yeah. and the, two the two classes I had to finish were economic statistics and industrial organization, which is basically word problems with calculus. So I had like yeah. basically two math classes and I, I passed them and I passed well. Um, so that felt really good too, of not being back in it for so long to be like, oh yeah, yeah. I can pick this up again. And, and I think that gave me a little bit of encouragement to be like, wait, if I can learn this and because I have enough drive and incentive to do that, what else could I learn if I had the drive and incentive for that too? Yeah. And that, that's what helped a lot in cyber for sure. Yeah, I, because I often give this advice is like, don't, don't pick a course or don't pick a degree, pick a career or what you want to achieve and then figure out backwards how to reach that goal. Because that's what happened to me. So I went to high school, they said, pick a degree. I was good at maths. I went and did a maths degree first and I did two years and I hated it. 
and the only jobs that they were kind of advertising coming out though they, they said i could be a statistician for the australian bureau of statistics or a teacher a math teacher and i didn't want to do either of those things so i actually took uh i think it was eight months off and went and got my personal training qualification and then was like oh, i don't like i really enjoyed it i didn't think i wanted to do it long term as a career and then went back and uh decided to do engineering and then kind of found there but engineering still wasn't the end for me like i was like oh i'll, I'll go be an electrical engineer and then kind of figure it out but i still didn't have an idea of career so it really takes time no matter how long it takes like i took longer than normal to finish my degree i think it took me six and a half seven years to finish a four-year degree um but then i like i'm now in an industry that doesn't require a degree so then i don't see that as a waste of time it was still a journey and still learning and i learned formal education in a tertiary setting and everything so um and i might not have made the transition into cyber if i hadn't have done all that so yeah it's it's definitely a piece of advice for anyone is you don't have to figure it out now but you also don't need to just go and do something because everyone else is doing it like think about what you want to achieve and then work backwards from there yeah absolutely and and i think you know it's kind of ironic that um sometimes if the path takes a little bit longer to achieve the goal that's okay i know sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard when we look around our world around us and we we come to some type of maybe it's a perception bias or something but we're like oh wow well most people get done in four why is it taking me six seven or in my case over 10 you know but but then what you realize when you in hindsight's 2020 but when you look back in retrospect you're like no yeah. that was the right time at the right place and if that's how long it took then that's okay you know just just giving that sense of permission internally that that's okay yeah. to do and you know the funny thing is even though at the time when i was an economics student before going back to finish it as i got older i actually liked reading about economics a lot, especially like macroeconomics. And so I'm like, oh, this is cool now, you know, but like <laughs> it kind of just goes full circle. And so there are some economics uh, principles and things I do apply um, in my day to day or at least learning cybersecurity concepts. Like, for example, ransomware attacks, mm -hmm. you know, you have concepts of economic incentives between what, you know, the other the other party's asking for, what the other party might give or not give. That becomes a very game theoretic sort of framework. Uh, and things like that. And that's covered a lot in econ, even just the economics of how companies run, like a simple cost benefit analysis and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I find that the econ stuff kind of <laughs> comes back to remind me that it's like, it's always still kind of there just, you know, yeah. once in a while. So, yeah. yeah. Well, if you think, you think about it, cybersecurity is all about mitigating risk, even if it's recovering from an attack or doing a pen test and risk is all related to money. And so, which is just like the economy of the business, like what is its main operational drive? How is it making its money? And then how to mitigate losing a shitload of money through a ransomware attack or, or something else? Because I think people look at often cybersecurity as a cost center because it's, it's not generating any money, but it's so important to the running of the business is it's not, it shouldn't be looked at losing money it should be looked at, well, it's saving money in the long term, because the more mm -hmm. secure you are now, the more efficient your processes could be, the less attacks you're going to have and the less money you need to spend. Because I know from my experience working in instant response, like in Australia in 2021, 20, 22, the average cost of just the instant response portion was somewhere like 300K to 500K, just for five weeks of instant response through external companies, the internal, like people that you're paying overtime, um, and then dealing with lawyers, because you need to get lawyers on board when it's PII data. So um, yeah, you're mitigating that cost in, in the long run. So yeah, it you know, all it's, does come back to economics, really. It does. You know, it's funny. I, I'm glad you mentioned the cost center analogy or how like cybersecurity is a cost center. I, I when I look at it, like, I see it as like, really just thinking about an insurance policy because that's really what it is. Cause at the end of the day, we're, we're mitigating risk. Well, if you buy an insurance policy, <laughs> right? Like let's, let's use the simple example. You go and get a rental car. Um, I, I don't know how it works in Australia cause I've never been there, but in the U S and, and maybe it's the same thing, but when you rent, when you get a rental car, you have the option 
to pay a little bit more money to maybe get like supplemental liability insurance. So yeah. like in case for some kooky reason, the car you have, like, I don't know, just does something off the rails or there's a ton of damage that's like probably not your fault, you know, then yeah. it's good that could have that extra policy on top of it. Um, I think functionally it's like an umbrella insurance policy, but regardless, mm -hmm. um, it's good to have the insurance before things happen because you want to be glad that you have it like you don't want to buy insurance quote unquote when the house is burning down <laughs> so I, I think that you know i think a mindset is is that cybersecurity is both mutually an investment activity and it's also an insurance activity and so you know that way i think the costs already almost always become justified because it's like yeah like if there's a ransomware attack and let's say that our cyber insurance doesn't cover it, you know, for example, like with a hypothetical company, then it's like, OK, well, that's the nominal actual real cost of that loss. But then there's reputation, then there's potential future litigation, things like that. Those numbers start adding up quick, whereas if in most instances had the cybersecurity initiatives been seen or valued as an insurance mechanism then it'd be like oh no we should really make sure we cross all of our t's and dot our i's metaphorically speaking yeah to have that in place so i always i always like the insurance analogy it's like oh no like anything in life where you know that there's a risk factor that's decent yeah just just get insurance on it in some way shape or form yeah and it's also the fact that the if you buy insurance and then you're doing the steps to protect your data in most companies situations their data is their crown jewels so the better understanding of it and the more protection you put around it and the more understanding you have of the workflow then that's where the efficiencies can come in to maybe make you more money because you're not wasting time moving data around in, in inefficient ways and it's so heavily tied to it but i think because it's so new and like we're we're still talking within a decade that ransomware has been so pervasive for companies and it's it's not really slowing down in that we've got all this technology and we've moved everything to the cloud and, and digital, like we're moving away from paper-based businesses that we haven't really thought of ways to do, or companies aren't still thinking of ways to do cybersecurity, not only to protect their data, but to make it more efficient for them so that they're not seeing it as as an overall benefit. They're still just like, ah, oh, regulation says we have to do cybersecurity. But it should be yeah. like, oh, regulation is saying we have to do cybersecurity, which means we have to spend money to do it anyway. We might as well try and find ways to make things more efficient so that the money that we are spending is making us more money in the long run. And I think yep. that's a, a better outside, out, outlook to look at the risk that's presented by things like ransomware and stuff. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, it reminds me that, that all that reminds me of like, you know, like restaurants, you know, mm -hmm. behind the scenes and even what's visible. There's a lot of food safety rules, no matter almost where you go on the planet, that mm -hmm. every restaurant has to follow. So when you're talking about, you know, cybersecurity and, and making sure proper systems are in place or, or doing the best that possibly can be done within constraints mm -hmm. to get that to happen. It's like, yeah, when you operate a restaurant, it's like there are health safety laws of like, yeah, we need to store foods at certain temperatures. We need to cook them within certain ranges. We need to make sure that we do first in first out called FIFO, you know, yeah. meaning that, Hey, expiration dates, let's not put the spoiled stuff into the next batch of whatever we're going to make because someone gets sick or we should probably post our um, food allergy notifications on our menu. Cause heaven forbid, we don't want someone to go into anaphylactic shock, you know, Some, something like that. So I, I feel that like a lot of it is just at the end of the day with whatever constrained resources are available and every company has those constraints is just yeah. can, what's the most meaningful, efficient way we can secure the system. So in the unfortunate event, if something does happen, despite everyone's best efforts, we can say at the end of the day, Hey, you know what? We were super proactive with this. We were really on top of it. And then what's nice is when that happens, usually the mitigation steps and the recovery becomes so much easier. Like what you were saying mm -hmm. with, data, with data, it's like, yeah, we know how we can recover it. We know what constraints there may be for that. We know like what our you know disaster recovery plan is and business continuity plan, all that stuff. And mm -hmm. rather than just check the box on a compliance thing, it's like there's a deeper rooted kind of knowledge or, or proactiveness yes. about it that's that's the, that's the number one thing i think that um yeah. if a company can achieve that they're they're looking good yeah yeah 
which all ties back to GRC, which is what I was, I, the talk that I was giving is, you can decide not to be in GRC, but you're going to be in GRC. No matter, no matter which branch of cybersecurity you decide to get yourself into, pen testing, instant response, SOC analyst, you work for a company or you're external, it all ties back to that governance risk and compliance steps yep. for, for everyone. And I, and especially as legislation is now catching back up and insurance companies are a lot smarter now. So you need to have mitigate, if you want cyber insurance, you can't just get blanket coverage anymore like you did back in 2021 when all the ransomware was happening. You now need to show steps that you are mitigating risk. And if you're not, then you won't, you'll, you either won't get a policy or your policy won't hold if you get attacked. So yeah. Yeah, so super, super important. All right, that got really deep and really philosophical for for the organizations. <laughs> that was that was cool. I liked it. Yeah. Um, back to yourself. Do you have any passion projects that you're doing at the moment? And this is like cyber or otherwise. So w what kind of interests you? Oh, geez. Um, well, I like playing video games. I, I no yeah. surprise there. I find most people, not everyone, but most people in the cybersecurity space love board games or video games or something yeah. in the in, in the gaming world. Um, what am I doing now? Jeez. Um, I mean, between school and work, sometimes it's like I have to like pause when I think about that. Um, I, I think for fun at home, even though I don't work professionally as a chef anymore, um, I still like to cook fun and challenging dishes. So I've actually been getting into African cuisine. Um, okay. And so I found a really cool book just to start that's actually written with recipes from like a bunch of like moms grandmothers and aunties about like oh here's like some cool recipes and here's the history behind it and it's all, it's all written by women which is fascinating and like their stories behind it so mm. it's really cool to read those stories first gain an appreciation for that and then try to to make the dish and yeah. it's, it's not the, it's obviously not the same thing as like going to a country and boots on the ground like learning and absorbing it yeah. that way but but at least in a in a way that helps in my time constraints that's the way i try to be aware of different cultures and try to appreciate, you know, um, the history and origins of things like that. And then it's kind of exciting because if I meet someone from a region or something like that, then it's like, cool, I have like something I can talk about and like, yeah. you know, appreciate that. So um, when I was in Michigan, I went to an Ethiopian restaurant and like, I actually got to have mm. stuff that tasted way better than what I could make, you know, because it was like, you know, people who, who are very good at this because part of their culture. And so it was yeah. great to be like, okay, like, this is like the real deal. And it's like so cool to have a conversation about them about or with them about the uh, the food and like their story of how they came to the US, all that stuff. So to me, that's yeah. really fun. I, I like food. I, I don't call it food tourism. I like food chronicling or chronicling or food, food discovery in the sense or rediscovery yeah. of things that are fun uh, or food appreciation is the best way to put it. Um, yeah. Because it's like it's really just appreciating the culture and acknowledging where um, that comes from. Um, mm -hmm. and then I think the other thing I like to do, um, I do gardening a little bit. Um, okay. I've kind of, kind of been a bit lax on it, but I like, uh, grafting fruit trees and like seeing if I can get like hybrid trees and stuff to grow. So I kind of like seeing and learning about that. Um, and, uh, I like playing guitar. I've been very rusty at it for years, but, um, I used to play a lot more and, uh, outside of that, this is a more long-term crazy hobby. I don't even know if I'll ever get it done, but I'm slowly working on designing a video game someday nice yeah just just an indie game and uh see if i ever get it done so but it's really fun to read about like um the programming behind that how to do graphics um i've actually been studying how to do the art behind that and actually just yeah. like learning how to do drawing and stuff like that so that's kind of fun nice yeah, yeah that's really cool i i have like some of the um like i've watched a few documentaries on like indie game developers and Especially some of the, the really popular games. I'm trying to think of the one where it's like you're this little rabbit in the um, in an ecosystem that's trying to kill you. And the guy, like his background, he was like an art major or something. And so how he made the game was really different because he had no programming skills. So um, it was really... Oh, I can't remember the name. Oh, are you talking about Undertale? No, not Undertale. Because I know that okay. was all programmed in like Python, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> It wasn't, um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's the other one. Oh, it just escapes me. You're this little white rabbit, and there's like all these predators around you. And when it rains, you've got to avoid the rain as well. Oh, um, oh yeah. Uh, I will post. I will try and find the documentary and post it down in the show notes for people because it was just super interesting how this 
person who knew nothing about game design, but had an idea of like an art style and what they wanted to create, and then the ways that they went around to make all the enemies interact. So they essentially all live in the background for the whole game, uh-huh. and they're constantly trying to hunt you, but they're just not on the screen. So it was it was quite instead of most game designs do like level where it's like the enemies will reset, whereas these enemies, and they all tried to hunt each other as well, so there was a pecking order, um, because he wanted to simulate an ecosystem of different predators, like, having that pecking order. So, yeah, that was, yeah, it was super interesting. But, yeah, I'll post that that in the show notes for people. That's a wild concept. I gotta gotta go check out that game and play that now, because that sounds really fun. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So that's really cool, and I guess that kind of covers off. Is, is there anything else in the next six to twelve months? And maybe uh, this could be more career focused, but what you want to achieve in that time? Yeah, um, between six and twelve months from now, I would like to sit in for the CISM exam and pass it. Obviously, it requires years of work in the industry before it's it's awarded after passing the exam. So you know, I'd like to sit in for the exam, see if I can pass that. Um, and then I would like to also sit in and pass the CAS Plus um, and see if I can do that. And I, I've got the vouchers for them, so I might as well use them or lose them, you yeah. know? So, um, but then I think the other thing um, that I would like to do, and that's really exciting, is I'm actually um, working on getting a little bit better at AI and applying that to different things. So going back to education, <laughs> I'm actually been applying to uh, get a second master's degree. <laughs> and I know, and I, I swear, I'm not an academic. I am probably like an armchair academic at best. Um, yeah. But so I've been applying for that. So hopefully within the next um, less than six months, I'll be starting hopefully next year spring in a program. Um, I haven't gotten any official news back yet of whether or not I've been accepted. Um, into places I've applied for, but we'll see what that is. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I promise I won't forever always be a college student, but you know, I, in my defense, I feel like maybe I'm, I'm personally trying to make up for my perception of lost time, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, for, from that, from that 10 year hiatus I took. So I'm like, okay, yeah. I'll just reinvest the 10 years later. <laughs> That's really cool though. And, but I guess it's like, you seem to have more drive now cause you know what you want to get out of it. And, and even like you said, like, you're appreciating the economics degree more now that there's more focus on something in particular you're looking for. So yeah, yeah. it's really, really cool. And, and I, I would say on a final note there that, you know, for anyone that ever thinks, Hey, I'm either, you know, if they're saying this to themselves saying that, Hey, either I'm too old for something or, Oh, I don't mm. know if I can do this. I would say it's never too old, especially for cybersecurity to explore and get into it but i would say that's true for most careers it's never too old you can always start at any time just i think do it from a place where you one love yourself two love others you know in terms of the family relationships you have be professional things like that if you can come to a a a headspace and an emotional and mental space where you're in that place or you you strive to get there uh, on that journey i think that's that's always the perfect time to um pursue the things in life that you want to try. And, you know, sometimes it's scary when you start. It was scary for me when I first started cyber. Like the first time I saw a Linux terminal, I'm like, what the heck is this? You know, now it's not so scary, but you know, as you do these things repeatedly in whatever art form you're learning, it gets a little bit easier over time. It doesn't look so cryptic. It's like, oh yeah, okay. And I, I've seen this or I've had this not work out a couple of times, but now I'm like learning this and, and it's just keep at it. And, uh, I always tell people in the the tech space, um, be kind to yourself, give yourself time to rest, give yourself time to spend time with friends and family. That's incredibly important. Um, business needs are important, but ultimately, you know, if, if, if there's damage or there's pain going on mentally or emotionally, you know, those are important things to, um, address and, uh, make sure that, you know, um, that can largely be mitigated or, or work through in a way that's proactive. So I, I always try to make a point to tell people that because I don't think that gets said enough um, in the tech industry. And uh, I, I hope that becomes more of a thing going forward. Yeah, yeah. It's a, actually interesting in the moment. So the um, other podcast that I'm on, we have been talking quite a lot about mental health in mainly digital forensics and particularly roles that are quite heavily into material that is 
quite frankly horrifying, um, particularly around CSAM, so child abuse um, exploitation material. There's there is definitely that thing of in Australia, I don't know whether the US has it, but recently we, we had Are You OK Day, which is a mental health checking day. Which is nice that it's around once a year that we have it, but it's it's definitely an ongoing thing because being, what are we in, September now? September's probably not the most stressful part of the year. Probably end of financial year, end of the year are the two, especially for cybersecurity professionals, are probably the really hectic times. So checking in in those times and in on yourself and your friends and family and, and colleagues is super important and i think to your point as well and i kind of look at it being too old and this could be quite morbid but if you look back 150 200 years ago we didn't live past 30. so if you're already like living past 30 and you're learning something new still you're you're doing pretty pretty good compared to your ancestors if you even look back 10 20 years ago we have so much more knowledge and information that is at our fingertips, which is awesome. But at the same time, our jobs have probably got it more complex. So even in the last two decades, you're doing much better from a work perspective, I think, than, than people 20 years ago. So it is, you're right, like it is important to take a step back and put that in, into perspective and realize within your life what actually is important because like I've changed jobs five six times now like since I've left uni and the the staying in the one career is long gone I think um, but you definitely can and there are people that do that but I think the general population is like if you want to learn something new you can just go and do something else learn something new and yeah you are never too old to to do that and step into a new role yeah for sure and then you know going back to the hiking analogy while doing that it's <laughs> ju just make sure to stop and smell the roses once in a while it's yeah. okay it's okay to do that and take a look at the view you know whatever that yeah. view may be yeah yeah we got really deep again there. We keep getting deep and we'll probably get deep on this one because I'm interested to know uh, what did you want to do when you were a little kid? Oh what my was, gosh. What was five-year-old Chris really into? Oh man, I had a lot of weird interest. Not weird. I just had a lot of interest as a kid. I yeah. initially wanted to be um, an archaeologist. So I had a fossil collection oh, cool. and like yeah. uh, geology stuff. And then um, at one point briefly astronaut crossed my mind but then I'm afraid of heights. So I was like, okay, that's not going to happen. <laughs> like I, I can fly an airplane just fine. But like you get me on a two story roof on top. I'm like, yeah. oh no, I'm like freaking out. Um, mostly. Um, and then what was the third one? Um, you know, briefly because my dad was a chef. Um, I actually wanted to be a chef when I was a kid at one point. Okay. Um, maybe when I was around like seven or eight years old. because I was cooking in the kitchen with my dad just learning stuff from him. So it was kind of cool to be like, oh, this is awesome, you know? Um, so those three things, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's really cool. And and good to, I guess, yeah, relate something back um, to what, what you enjoy doing with your dad as well. And I guess you kind of have touched on that as a career, right? Like working as a, yeah. as a chef. So you ended oh, up yeah. doing that a little bit and it, it's an interest now still. Yeah, I can I can comfortably say, and it wasn't because I planned this. I just over the arc of working in the culinary industry, I, I have worked every aspect in that business, from the wholesale to the business to running the restaurant to um, all that. And it's, it was it was a very long arc that occurred with that, and a lot of unplanned changes. But uh, if I ever got, I wouldn't say if I ever got bored. If if I had a wheelbarrow full of money to burn someday. Um, or had excess funding where I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. And I had to do some passion project. It would probably be open a small restaurant and then uh, just have fun with it and feed people and hopefully they have a good time. But that's probably something more like if I ever get to the point of retirement <laughs> and, and, and I don't like uh, being retired, that's probably what I would do. <laughs> so, if yeah. I, so, if I, so if I open a restaurant someday, it's probably because, oh, yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's probably in his 60s or 70s and he's just looking to get out of the house. <laughs> I, I honestly feel the same way. I, did, I don't see myself retiring. I think I, think I saw that with my grandparents and the, I think the deterioration speeds up when you don't have something to do that's challenging. Yeah. 
And so, like, I, I don't ever want to step away from doing something and, and having, I think, a purpose. I think purpose definitely increases longevity yeah. um, within all of us. So, and also, like, for yourself, having such a, a core skill of being a chef and cooking is, like, it's universal. There's cooks everywhere. The laws are pretty much the same everywhere with food safety, right? So it's it's also a nice, from a career security background, is like, it's something to fall back on, which is always nice, I think. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that, that's the cool thing of learning skills. You know, once once you've learned that, once you've gone through that, you, you still have that. It doesn't go away when, you're, yeah. when your formal career is done. So, you know, yeah. like, like, like we were saying, who's to say that someday, maybe it's cool to come back to that or maybe that becomes another new chapter um for sure but yeah i think i think learning new things and like you're saying as you get older just being more active with that sense of purpose i think that goes a long way it goes a long way for mental health too because then 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 you're you know always engaged and um always active i I find that mental atrophy sometimes can be the first onset of Mm aging or things versus sometimes the physical things it depends a case by case basis on a person but i find that by and large if mentally and emotionally there's more proactive engagement usually it's it's a little more efficient to um live with the health physical aspects too in in many instances not not all but many yeah i just like a business idea popped into my head for when you turn 60. (laughs) <laughs> is that I know I know in Japan they're already and in some other countries they're putting robots into restaurants and I'm sure AI will get into those robots and so you're doing cybersecurity I can just imagine you being head robot chef where <laughs> you just all your staff are robots and you're managing the cybersecurity and running a restaurant at the same time so I, I can def- definitely see that in your future if if it were i would still want humans in the loop though because like i i i think though um and i won't go into too much detail about about this because i feel like i have a moral and ethical obligation not to because i i have invested in some ai food companies but i will say in general that i do think a lot of the um mundane repetitive tasks that sometimes can have a, a physical safety aspect in the kitchen because you got knives you got Mm -hmm. hot things stuff like that some of those more routine things that can really wear down the body over years um many of those tasks could be uh automated through robots but at the same time and with ai um but at the same time you still want people there because at the end of the day it's still it's still a service job and there's something to be said about the camaraderie that can occur in a kitchen provided that that kitchen is ran professionally and respectfully that's a that's a Mm -hmm. two big caveats there but um provide it's a very proactive environment the camaraderie you get from a kitchen is really fun it's like i don't know it's its own thing i can't i can't really map it to something else but it's it's the exciting part of it then sometimes the organized chaos of that it can be (laughs) equally exhausting but equally thrilling (laughs) so yeah (laughs) that's really really cool all right so we're at our final question for today and it's what recommendations do you currently have for people that are outside the industry that are looking to get in. Now, we've probably touched on quite a lot of points through this this talk. So maybe it's something, a pearl of wisdom that you can leave for the, the people that are listening up to this point. Yeah, um, wherever, wherever anyone's at in their journey of learning and being interested in cybersecurity and skilling up, I would say the number one thing to do, and two things at once. One, network with people, be involved with community things for that things like that whether it's um different organizations you can become a member of sometimes it's for free sometimes it's for relatively low expense and then along with that do some projects and some home labs that that goes a long way because you could have the best looking degree in the world but if you can't show that you can do the thing whether or not that's something on a github page or a blog which i kind of like blogs because it demonstrates hard skills and soft skills because you have to write about what's going on. And so you're kind of accomplishing all that together. Um, I I would say do that. Um, I think that's, that's the most important two places to start. And those are two things that don't end They're They're two things that keep growing slowly over time. And it actually reminds me, I need to get back to like posting more on my blog because it's been, it's been quite a while, (laughs) but um, you know, so that'd be it, you know, that way you can show you can do the thing. And you're also connecting with more people in the community. And that's the whole thing is at the end of the day, 
and cybersecurity is a community of people that are trying to secure things and that community yeah. is very powerful yeah i i would definitely agree with that i think i've talked quite a lot we haven't touched on it in this this podcast at all but when you're in an organization documentation of processes so if you are doing something that you know someone else is going to have to do or even yourself will have to do it again in three months time document that process and make sure you have someone review it to make sure that there's no assumed knowledge that you're skipping a step and that's exactly what a blog does i think is that it's you've learned something and then you're teaching someone who knows nothing about it or has a technical background but may not have done this before it shows that you can document your own process and thought to re achieve the same result and it's that that whole scientific method you're explaining how you can redo it and that for me if i was looking to hire anyone if someone can document like do something and then document it that i could then follow and do without like i you always come up with weird and wonderful bugs in all of it but if most if 90 percent of it's there like that's that's a huge skill like because it shows research it shows technical understanding it shows the soft skills of communication and it, it shows a skill that is honestly quite lacking in nearly every organization that i've worked for across the majority of not because people aren't smart enough it's just that people get too caught up in doing their job and they don't document and then six months later you're like how do i do this and they're like oh you just enter this one command and you're like why wasn't that written down kind of thing so yeah huge huge skill being able to blog i think that's and that's something to, I think, take away if you ever get asked in an interview of like, what skills do you think you could bring? If you've written a blog, explaining that I think is huge. Cause I think even a lot of recruiters don't realize the connection between the two. So yeah, yeah. really good way to end. Well, mate, thanks so much for taking some of your evening to join me on the podcast and have a chat. It's been a pleasure. And this is, I think the first time we've did we, I can't even remember whether we had a call before we did this. I think it was just LinkedIn chats, right? Yeah, this is the first time we've actually like talked to each other <laughs> and saw each other on video, you know, so yeah. you can see you can see my messy office here that I have to clean up, but you know, <laughs> it's not too bad, but yeah, so yeah. it's kind of a lot of cool firsts and stuff and uh, I'm really yeah. excited. I've been watching how your uh, podcast and stuff has been growing and I really have a lot of respect for that. It's really cool to see Thanks, um, all the cool interviews you have and stuff like that because it really helps the community a lot. You know, I think the more that we have with that going on in the space, the better um, for sure. So yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, thanks, mate. And thanks everyone for listening or watching on YouTube. What you can do to support the channel is just hitting that subscribe button. That will really help me out. If you want to find more content, you can grab it all from my website, hardlyadequate.com, and I post most things on YouTube as well. And you can grab this podcast to listen to from where, wherever you get your podcast from. But thanks, everyone, and I'll see you all next time. Cool. So...